take up from where we left off. But the heavenly heart and the head, when would it have moved in the least? Dost thou ask, can the heavenly heart not be moved? Then I answer, how could the true thought in the square inch be moved? Deep stuff, huh? Well, welcome to the secret of the golden flower. This is where we talk about the deep stuff. So, uh, the true thought in the square inch is the realization of emptiness, which is gotten by turning around the light, reversing the energy flow from outward to inward in the Agnya Chakra, the square inch. We've gone over this before. I'm just saying it for those who are new. Emptiness has no qualities whatsoever. It neither exists nor doesn't exist. It does not come into being, huh? it will never come into being. So it has no past or future and no location. Well, where is emptiness? Well, you could say, Emptiness is everywhere. Well, if it's everywhere, then it's nowhere. Because it's here, and it's there, and it's over there. It's in this, it's in that, it's, it's everywhere. Yet, emptiness is very difficult for us to realize because of our habit of creating a self. Isn't it? As soon as we come into being, as soon as we make a self, then we have a location, we have mass, we have movement. Huh? All those things come together as soon as you have being or non-being, because non-being can only be in relation to being, just like darkness can only be in relation to light. It's the absence of the same thing. But emptiness is not in relation to anything. And because of that, it has no location, has no properties, cannot have any movement. Huh? This is why someone who realizes emptiness is said to have all-pervading knowledge. Because emptiness is everywhere and nowhere. It's a wonderful thing, emptiness. It's a terrifying thing, because to realize it, one has to go beyond being and non-being, and lose the self, lose the mind, lose everything. Being and nothingness are opposites, but emptiness is beyond all pairs of opposites. It's simply incomparable. And that's why it's the absolute. So the true thought in the square inch cannot be moved. It's immovable because it's already all pervading and absolute. So then he goes on to say, if it really moves, it is not well. For when ordinary men die, then it moves. But that is not good. It is best indeed if the light has already fortified itself in a spirit body and its life force gradually penetrated the instincts and movements. But that is a secret that has not been revealed in thousands of years. So this is deep. 
This is very deep. What happens at death? At death, the emptiness, that is the field of awareness, that is the being, moves from the square inch, leaves the body, and then the body dies. So this emptiness is absolutely essential for life. That's why it's said, every being has Buddha nature. Every being has this emptiness, which is the field of awareness. And of course, consciousness is based on that. So as soon as consciousness leaves the body, the body is considered dead, useless, junk. Throw it away. Get rid of it. <laughs> we don't want it around. Because without that principle of emptiness, the body then has no organization. Nothing keeping it together. Nothing keeping it functioning. So that's the end of life, the dead body. But this emptiness goes on to accept another body. According to the conception or the understanding, or the realization of the being. So I'm not going to try to get into now how the individual being, or individual emptiness, is distinguished from the whole, because they're indistinguishable. Yet, because that emptiness becomes identified with the body, then we have individualism, identity, and so on. This is a deep subject, and it's best realized, not thought about, not debated or discussed. <laughs> Those are only words. Those can't really help us. But as soon as we begin to realize emptiness, this helps us tremendously. Now, with emptiness, or when we're coming from emptiness, life becomes effortless. Life becomes easy. Because now there's no going out. There's only coming in. The energy has been reversed. The flow has been changed from extroversion to introversion. This is meditation. So when meditation happens, at first it's in a kind of a controlled environment. You're sitting there and you're concentrating and so on. But as this realization permeates one's whole being, meditation becomes a constant state of effortless awareness, spontaneous. It's easy, it's light, it's beautiful, it's so beautiful. And so from a terrifying idea Emptiness becomes a refuge, unshakable, uh, unchanging, unmoving. But this is the real samadhi. This is the nibbana. Hmm? That one becomes this pool of emptiness that nothing can disturb. It's so wonderful. And the key to it all is this spirit body. Huh? The Buddha called it Manomaya Kaya. Manomaya means made of spirit or mind made. So the Manomaya Kevala is mentioned many, many times in the Buddha Sutras. Let me read you just one. With his mind thus concentrated, purified and bright, unblemished, free from defects, pliant, malleable, steady and attained to imperturbability. He directs and inclines it to creating a mind-made body. Manomayakaya. From this body, he creates another body, endowed with form, made of the mind, complete in all its parts, not inferior in its faculties. 
just as if a man were to draw a sword from its scabbard. The thought would occur to him, this is the sword, this is the scabbard. The sword is one thing, the scabbard another, but the sword has been drawn out from the scabbard. In the same way, with his mind thus concentrated, purified and bright, unblemished, free from defects, pliant, malleable, steady, attained to imperturbability. The monk directs and inclines it to creating a mind-made body. From this body he creates another body, endowed with form, made of the mind, complete in all its parts, not inferior in its faculties. When a disciple of a teacher attains this sort of grand distinction, lohicca, that is a teacher not worthy of criticism in the world. And if anyone were to criticize this sort of teacher, the criticism would be false, unfactual, unrighteous, and blameworthy. And then there's more, many more. Knowing my thought, the world's unsurpassed teacher, the Buddha, came up to me in his mind-made body using his psychic powers. Again, Udayan, I have proclaimed to my disciples the way to create from this body another body having form, mind-made, with all its limbs, lacking no faculty. And thereby many disciples of mine abide, having reached the consummation and perfection of direct knowledge. And there's so many more quotes. I could spend an hour going through them. I found uh, more than 40 instances of this phrase, Manomaya Kevala, in the suttas. Now, if you go down to your local Buddhist temple, you're never going to hear them discuss this. Why? It's more or less of a secret among the monks, the practitioner monks. The scholar monks avoid it because they know they don't have it. <laughs> and they can't talk about it. Because actually in the suttas you will not find the method for making this mind-made body. So where are those instructions? In the Vedas especially in the Vedas or Puranas and Tantras that talk about bhakti. Now, this is very strange. Why would the scriptures on bhakti talk about something that's later on referred to by the Buddha, but which is not present in the Buddha suttas as far as the procedures, the techniques go? Because in the Buddha's time, now 2,600 years ago, all educated people knew the Vedas. They all had read the Itihasas and Puranas. They all knew the Tantras. Any educated person, educated in the sense of having spiritual knowledge, being a sadhu, being someone who is meditating, practicing on a daily basis. They all knew this. This was common knowledge. Not common, but among the educated class of people, the Brahmins at least, and the kings. The kings were hearing direct from the Brahmins. So they knew these arts. They knew Raj Yoga, Tantra Yoga, so many things like that. So the Buddha often referred to this knowledge in his suttas without giving it explicitly. Why? Because it was already available. Huh? It was common knowledge. Just as if I were to say to you, um, go down to the store and buy a package of vegetables. Huh? You could easily do that without specific instructions, because that's part of our culture. Similarly, in those days, this knowledge of yoga, how to make a mind-made body, how to make an astral body, was well known. And it's very simple. Basically, you create 
many, many impressions, sangskaras, mental image impressions or pictures of a particular type of body. This gets back to name and form again. You see, actually the Buddha did give, did give the technique, not explicitly, but implicitly in Paticca Samupada, dependent origination. Now, if you haven't gone back and watched the Foundation series, go back and watch those three videos now, because everything I'm going to be talking about from here on <laughs> involves Paticca Samupada, and I'm not going to go through it again, okay? Rather, I'm going to refer you to the materials where we already talk about that and where Buddha and Buddha Das Bhikkhu especially uh, talk about it in their books. So, by this means, by creating many, many, many mental impressions of a particular state of being, one can achieve that state without fail. In fact, we do it every day. We do it anyway, but we do it without knowledge. Hmm? Look, what are people doing when they wear a, a sweatshirt with a sports team logo on it? A common enough thing these days, right? Aren't they saying, I have these qualities. I am cultivating this mindset. Huh? I'm trying to make a winning mind, a winning body, a type of self that can prevail in a competition. That's what it means when you wear a sports jersey with a logo on it. That's a simple thing. But what about prayer? In prayer, one is putting a message out into the cosmos, into the universe, that I want to be like this and like that. Huh? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See? Make this earth just like the heaven. Not likely, but it's a nice sentiment. <laughs> but what we're saying is, if you create these thoughts again and again and again, then slowly, slowly, that kind of body is created. Name and form. We keep telling you, name and form, nama rupa, is the key to paticca samuppada. Huh? Name and form. I am a Buddha. And what is a Buddha like? So many qualities. So by holding that form, I am a Buddha, I am a Buddha, slowly, slowly, one becomes a Buddha. What are we doing huh, when we sit in meditation posture? Well, among many other things, <laughs> we're imitating the Buddha. You see millions and millions of statues of the Buddha sitting down in a certain posture. It's called easy posture or siddhasana. That folding one, putting one leg on top of the other, folding the palms by the dantian, just below the navel. It's, it's a, a mudra. It's a physical form that embodies a certain energy flow. And that flow is what leads to a Buddha. So we're trying to realize, <laughs> to realize means to embody the qualities of a realized being, huh? to situate the emptiness in the square inch between the two eyes, and to pervade the entire body with that energy. This leads naturally to the creation of the dharmakaya, the realized body, and the Manomaya Kaya. But these are old terms. They existed way before the Buddha. So try to understand. We're not talking about any kind of arcane yoga thing. Although if you want to create a specific type of body and let's say go to a particular planet and take birth there in your next life to have better conditions for self-realization, you can do that too. And these rituals, these practices are well known in Indian society. They've been going on for thousands of years. But then the reason for it got lost. Huh? That's why he says this secret has not been given in thousands of years. 
People know the procedures, but they don't know why. Or people know that they want to have a spirit body, a mind-made body, but they've forgotten how. But we know both why and how in the secret of the golden flower.